Uh, we want to welcome all the coaches uh, from the WBCA and the NABC, as well as others around the country who have elected to join us today. Uh, obviously, we are living in un uh, unprecedented times with a pandemic that is now eight months old. Uh, the virus has disrupted all aspects of daily life, including on our college campuses and with our college student athletes. Today, we are going to gather more helpful information with four people who are in the middle of this quote unquote natural disaster. Uh, Lynn Bria, four time Atlantic Sun Conference champion and Stetson's women's basketball coach. She's the all time winningest coach in her 13th year, the Hatters. In the last 12 years, she's built a, uh, a dominant program in the, in the American Sun. Uh, three conference titles, two NCAAs, five women's NITs and uh, eight, nine postseasons. Uh, just tremendous. Uh, Lynn, thank you for being with us. Uh, also with us today, Kathy Meehan, former colleague of mine who I worked for at St. John's. She's now in her 44th year of service at St. John's, going back to uh, the days as, as a uh, terrific women's uh, student athlete back in the early 70s. Uh, she's senior deputy athletic director. Uh, she has represented St. John's on numerous NCAA and Big East committees during her tenure. Most recently, she was appointed to the Division I Women's Basketball Oversight Committee, which works to enhance the development and public perception of the sport and make recommendations to regular season and postseason women's basketball. She's currently the chair of the competition committee. Mike McGrath, in his 22nd year, is the head coach at the University of Chicago. He's a school's all-time leading uh, uh, leader in wins. Uh, great program. The Maroons are constantly ranked in Division Three. He also serves on the, the board of the NABC, and he's also in his third year uh, on the NCAA Men's uh, Playing Rules Committee. And finally, Dr. James Cluxton, an accomplished leader in academic research and medicine. He currently serves as the team physician for the University of Florida Athletic Association and as the uh, program director of the Florida University of Florida Sports Medical Fellowship, a fellowship which he founded in 2007 uh, additionally, he serves on the NCAA COVID-19 Medical Advisory Group and the SEC Return to Activity and Medical Guidelines Task Force. So we welcome all four of you. We thank you for your time today and your expertise. Uh, Dr. Cluxton, um, we're going to start with you to give us uh, what would be the 30,000 view of what's going on right now in college athletics and particularly college basketball as we head into the winter. Uh, what um, what medical updates should coaches be aware of at this time, based on where we are today in mid October? I think so. We've been dealing with this, you know, since last March, and um, a lot of things have changed. A lot of things haven't changed. We we I think we're in a lot better situation for tests and and supplies of tests and availability. Uh, we also have a better understanding of some mechanisms and, and habits and uh, actions we can take to to really decrease or mitigate the risk of spread. Uh, so we're heading into the basketball season here, having some experience with mainly outdoor sports, at least at least what I've been working with, um, and some optimism that we haven't seen spread in the play of sports, like between teams. But most of this has been an outdoor sport, so. And we got the NBA and WNBA great examples where, with success in basketball. So we're kind of heading into basketball with, with optimism, but, but also cautiousness because we're going to be playing a sport that's indoors, has a lot of close contacts, aerobic, people running, breathing hard, um, and not much spacing. So there's going to be some challenges. So I think I would say from the medical community, we're, we're cautious and um, – but still feel like it's something we need to to work through and figure out how to do it. And we got a lot of young people that that want to play basketball and people really interested in it. So we're 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 getting there. We'll we'll, we'll learn a lot as we go. One of the terms that we've heard used throughout this uh, last few months, especially as sports returns, is the idea of contract. Excuse me, contact tracing. Um, tell us, give us a give us a quick synopsis of what that means, and is it currently non-negotiable? 
So contact tracing is is figuring out when you get a positive person, who do they, who have they been in contact with and who is at risk of getting the infection from them. We're, we're still uh, using the definition of six feet and 15 minutes. And just yesterday, the CDC kind of came out with some different language on the 15 minutes. They say it's cumulative over 24 hours. So it's not cumulative over five days, but um, it is cumulative. So you can't have 30 seconds here and walk away and 30 seconds there and then count that as 30 seconds. That's a minute. But um, that's kind of what we're using to operate or to come up with this that wasn't designed for exercising people. That was just, you know, come up with people in normal daily activity. Um, but it's a method to kind of see who might be at risk. And, and right now, our, uh, there might be a little leeway. We, we initially said, we, we talked about this, uh, you know, a team like basketball that practices together and they're indoors that if someone tested positive that and they had just recently practiced that the whole team might have to be quarantined and coaches and, and the NSA talks about these in tier one and tier two and tier three you've probably seen that in those groups so your tier one group would probably be um, put on on a quarantine but the the language is, is softened just a little bit it says that now if, if this person tests positive you would quarantine this tier one group initially until you can do thorough contact tracing. So you may have uh, ways to look back at film and, and look at other things and figure out that maybe not this whole group it needs to be quarantined. So there's a little bit of optimism there. And then there's also work being done through the CDC now to really look at what, how long does this need to go? Is 14 days um, the, the optimal length or, or can we still do it safely shorter? And I, before this call, we were talking about a little bit, I think there's some proposals out to look at, you know, what if you could test this quarantine group frequently, could you shorten it down? And I, I think our, our next step will be uh, some group like the CDC will say that seems reasonable and kind of put it in writing and other groups can kind of look at it almost in a study. And uh, we may be able to, to, to uh, shorten it somewhat. I don't think it's gonna go to zero uh, what I'm hearing is may, maybe you, you take an eight or nine day, you know, chop it from 14 to eight or nine, and, and but you start testing five, six, seven those days. But we'll see. I, and I'd be interested to hear what the other people in the group have heard or think about it. I, I will say we, we've had some um, people turn positive out at, you know, seven days after they had been exposed to somebody, have not seen somebody go at 14 days, although there's reports of that. But that's how, how they initially settled on 14 days. There are a few reports of people turning positive that, that far out. Right. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Kathy, given the NCAA guidelines that came out September 25th, what protocols are you um, implementing at, at a place like St. John's, which I'm sure is going to be true of many other sister schools? We had a task force here at St. John's operating. We just had our 54th meeting. Um, it's our task force of return to play. So we started this back in April. Uh, we meet twice a week, and it's a, it's a combination of uh, coaches, student athletes, administrators, training staff, folks. And uh, so part of that was to put, put things together, put protocols in place uh, to return safely. So that, that started back in April, and it got us through to getting our student uh, men's and women's basketball back in July. And then it, it worked. we worked towards uh, getting the rest of our student athletes back in August. And part of that has to, you know, what had to do from everything from how we enter the building, um, how uh, with temperature checks and, um, and, and checking people in and, and our building now, as many buildings are, they're just for our student athletes use. And then coming into the building is not free access back and forth. It's coming in for the purpose of playing, uh, you know, practice, uh, uh, rehab, uh, could be academic uh, uh, tutoring sessions, but they all need to be scheduled. So all of our activities are all scheduled. And so everybody comes into our, our building. We have uh, signage all around um, to indicate talking about the safe habits, uh, you know, and talking about using, you know, sanitizing and washing your hands and wearing the masks. And the requirement is a mask so ah. at all time. Um, and so we, we, we created all types of things like that. And we had a communication system also that communicated out to our teamwork, Teamworks uh, app to all of our student athletes to ensure that they knew what was going on. So, so I, along with that, we've had, as many of you have had, 
uh, Zoom meetings, WebEx meetings, Microsoft, uh, you know, like everything under the sun to communicate with our coaches and our student athletes kind of on a, a regular basis to let them know what was going on, why it was going on, and to, to uh, make sure they were aware of what the um, requirements were going to be to get back to play. Um, and obviously testing is another part of it. So we, we you know, followed the, the, even before the NCAA came up with their guidelines about testing, we had our own testing protocols in place on a weekly basis. And then we've got the surveillance testing as well. Um, and we usually do have done more than what the NCAA has required as, as a minimum to, to protect yourselves all along the way. So it's been a, um, a frustrating experience for everyone. Um, it's also been, very rewarding to see everybody come together and work towards, uh, you know, getting back to, to what we love to do. And um, so yeah. that part has been good. And, and the doc said, you know, words about cautiously optimistic. So we're cautiously optimistic about the days ahead. Um, we're, you know, they, we just came up with the guidance and recommendations for game day operations for basketball, of which, you know, I was a part of and Lynn was a part of, and actually lots of people are, are part of putting together. It's a working document. Um, it will change. Uh, as we learn more and as we uh, get feedback more from folks as they as we actually start to operate. Um, but again, we're cautiously optimistic about this um, and, and look forward to getting our kids to be back and our coaches and our officials back into a safe and healthy environment. Before we hear from Lynn and Mike, I want to ask you just one quick follow up. How do you know the student athletes are coming clean about contacts? about contacts yeah um, how, do you, well, how do you get them to kind of like hey i gotta tell you this this i was with so and so and i think it was more than 15 minutes i mean how do you how do you regulate well we, we have constant communication with our student athletes about about the the whole tracing part we fortunately have had not had a lot of um positives here um we've been fairly po i don't know what it jinxes so i'm not gonna say anything more but um <laughs> But, but we do we do we do quarantine for symptoms. So so it's a constant educational process about that because when that occurs and someone has some symptoms, we do have the conversations with our training staff and we have a contact tracing group in the department that talks to them about possibly where else they have been, who else they might have been with, did you go home this weekend, those kinds of things just prepare us in case we need to kind of go further. But again, we we talk about in New York City, it's 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 not only six feet, but it's 10 minutes, not 15 minutes. So ours is a little bit tighter, um, as, as we know, we're in New York. Um, so uh, uh, so that's that's what we do. We, and we, we encourage the kids really, um, it's not ratting people out to tell them that where you've been around, it's really to protect the health and safety of the student athletes. So the importance of really being honest and forthright will right. help everybody. It's not, gonna, it's not gonna help by being dishonest about it. All right, Wayne, you're in the beautiful central Florida down there, palm trees in the background. What are the specific day-to-day -day challenges you're encountering with your student athletes right now? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, we, yeah, we are, we got the palm trees in the background, but <laughs> we also have Orlando and Miami who are hot, you know, places of yeah. hot spots. So uh, we've asked our, our players not to, not to go there is one of the things we've done. Um, but the, I would say the biggest challenge for us friend is is the unknown i mean you just you know you just and we're all navigating through this doing the best we can and i've served on you know kathy and i've been on quite a few calls together it's just you know you're doing the best you can with the information you have um you know for me we get tested every week so now as a coach you adapt to okay i have you know um, i have six more days of confirmed practice and that's all I have. And now you plan for more and you, you hope for the best, but you know, we actually had a false positive on our team and um, that shut us down for three days, but it was false. So um, we, were, we were very, very fortunate in that regard. But I think the challenges for me and just, just scheduling in regards to, you know, as a coach from a coaching perspective, you know, I, I've tried to put everything in, you know, I know it's crazy, but we're not really good at anything. We also did the phases as Kathy was talking about, you know, when we were in phase one, we had no defense. The, the offense looked unbelievable, by the way, that we were scoring points at a rapid rate. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and then I've thought about doing things like two groups, you know, having two groups, keeping them separate, you know, but at some point, 
um, you know, we're not tennis, we're not golf. We have to, we have to guard each other and we have to play. And, you know, I think, um, you know, we, we've, we've been in phase three for a while now and, and uh, needless to say, we're, we're playing defense or the best we can. And, um, but I think those challenges, the, the stuff of wearing the mask and hand sanitation and all that, and we spray everything down and there's 15 minutes in between each so we can get the, uh, the teams, you know, get the gym sprayed down. So, you know, I think, you know, all of us are doing that. Those things are, are you know, they're different for us, but if we get to play, I'll be very happy. I think, you know, but I think for basketball, when one player gets tested to shut the whole thing down, I, I just... That's going to be interesting. I just I hope we can come up with something that's safe, that um, you know that that will allow us to still continue. I do like you know like they were saying before the tracing where um, you know we just have to trust our kids are telling the truth because like I told our players if you don't tell the truth and you know this could shut us all down forever and we don't want that. We want to be able to play, and so we very much encourage our kids to tell the truth. I'd rather be shut down temporarily than have this thing go rampant. Um, so uh, th that's some of it for us, but I, I think we just the, we just take it each week and we get tested every week. And, and uh, we I think our players have done a good job. And I think Stetson University has done a good job. We had a major change in our um, our academic calendar. So we actually started school two weeks earlier. Uh, we did not get to come to summer schools. So it's great to hear that, you know, at St. John's they got to. We did not get to do that. They shut that down. Um, so, but we also, our, our uh, university, these uh, the student body gets to go home right before Christmas and they do not come back until the middle of January. Every right. student here gets their own room. So I think that's helped us a lot too. All of our players are in their own room. And I think that that also helps us, helps us as well as far as the university and the, some of the things they've done, I think have, have been very beneficial uh, to, our, to our team. Yeah, you know, Mike, with your you're in a unique situation because your season will not begin until after the new year. Hopefully I'm knocking on wood for you right now. Thank you. Um, how much are you observing and learning from what you're hearing from your peers, both on and off the court as you have a little bit more time to evaluate the protocols? Thanks, Fran. And, and first of all, I just wanted to share with everybody I, this collaboration between the WBC and the NABC is phenomenal. Um, I watched the voting webinar a couple weeks ago and, and now doing this at the University of Chicago, we have a, a long history over my 20 years of working closely with the women's basketball program. And it's been one of the most rewarding parts of my professional experience. And I think us doing this on a broader level is just such a terrific thing. Um, the biggest thing I've tried to focus on as I get ready is, and you're right, you know, coaches talk, we share. It's one of the great things about our profession. Um, it's one of the things I love about the colleagues that I have. And, you know, we're always seeking whatever we can find out about what different people are dealing with and what they're facing and hurdles they've had to overcome. My approach has tr been to try to kind of focus on what I can control. I think Lynn hit the nail on the head. You know, the unknown, the uncertainty, the change is really hard for coaches. And if I just focus on what I can do at the moment, it's probably the best thing for me. And I picked that up from some of my colleagues. Um, I think people, the medical professor, professionals like Dr. Cluxton and the athletic administrators like Kathy, um, I've always had respect for, and it's at an all-time high right now. The work that they're doing is phenomenal. And quite candidly, I don't understand all that goes into that stuff. I'm just waiting for feedback from them on how to move forward and then trying to figure out how to do the right things. And in talking to my colleagues, um, you know, we have, to be, we have to be creative. We have to adapt to whatever situation we're in. We have to be creative in dealing with that. And then we have to be flexible because that whole circle might start over again. You know, we can't have a plan and think, okay, we're moving forward because two days later that, and there's nothing wrong with that changing. That's healthy because we're all dealing with such an unknown thing. So I think, as, you know, that's been our mantra with the team is adapt, be creative, and be flexible because you may have to adapt again and be creative again. So that's, that's right. kind of where we're at. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. yeah, that's great stuff. Doc, um, how, how is the medical community on a college campus like Florida communicating um, the important messages of personal responsibility 
to your coaches and administrators who obviously are going to pass that on to their student athletes. How's that chain of, chain of information flow work is probably a better way to put it. That's a great, a great topic, friend. Um, you know, here we've got a lot of help. We have a big staff and we have, um, five primary care sports physicians and three orthos and, you know, we have a great athletic training staff. So it's really been a lot of communication between the docs and athletic training. And then, uh, our athletic director has really been uh, vocal and been a part of our discussions. And then he kind of sets the tone for the, the program. And we've had meetings with coaches uh, and then we're available for coaches. I, I really, uh, going through the fall so far, I really um, see that the coaches have such a huge role in this. And the, the ones that I've seen set great examples. Um, it's really been helpful to get the kids to buy in. And um, we've got some football coaches, phenomenal, you know, do everything right. And as we probably know, we've had a little outbreak and the people, I mean, some of the people that really did things right, they're good. I mean, it's kind of shown me that, that the actions you take can really help you um, eliminate or, or not, you know, spread this disease. And, you also see players pick up on that. So I, I've really uh, having communication with the coaches have been great. Um, and then if the coaches are able to set a great example and then develop leaders on their team that actually encourages their players to take this serious, uh, it works really well. We're, we're battling in some cases, a little bit of COVID fatigue right? for football. You know, we started off and then we, we did, we did a road game and we did some things and then, you know, I think things look like they're going great. And, and we're also battling a little bit of false sense of security with the testing. Because for, for football and the, those high-risk transmission sports in the fall, they've been testing three times a week. And then basketball is going to roll into that soon. But, you know, it, once you went into three times a week, it, it almost encouraged people to be a little bit complacent or if you're doing daily testing. And, and we've had to uh, really emphasize the point that the testing doesn't keep you safe. It's your habits and your actions and following the, the rules and, and uh, being really vigilant that does and your outside activities outside of sport. Uh, and so having coaches that keep saying that over and over and telling our players has been wonderful. So I, you know, it's really, I feel like the coaches have the most um, important and influential role really. And, and they, as long as you're able to communicate back and forth, I think that's what's the most important thing. Yeah, good stuff. Um, Kathy, you're in between the medical people and the coaches on a daily basis. Um, one question, how, how, are you how are you taking specific precautions to isolate a student athlete that, you know, has a positive from the rest of the student athlete population? What's so that we, protocol like? So we, ha we have a designated uh, dorm set aside. Okay. So anybody that uh, is in that category immediately gets sent to that. So that's actually pretty easy for us. Um, and it turns over to residence life and student, uh, you know, the student health services uh, that takes care of them. And, and then anyone else that's, again, the contact tracing goes along the, the way. We, we communicate. We actually have a, a standing uh, call at 4 o'clock every day with our, um, um, with our training staff, our, ourselves, our, the COVID task uh, co-chairs, and, um, and then the university student health services. And we go over everybody that's in any particular situation, whether that they've got a symptom, whether or not they're, they're coming off of uh, 14 days or whatever this, the situation is, because they have to have the appropriate doctor's notes and clearances to actually come back. So, so we have a lot of good communication that goes on within the university so that uh, everyone knows what's going on and then we communicate that back to our coaches. Good, great stuff. Uh, Lynn and Mike, how are, you, how are you navigating the chain of command, like up the chain to your trainers and uh, tra your trainers would be happy to know that I consider them up to chain of command in this regard, but uh, your trainers and, and then your, you know, your athletic administrators, how is that working on a daily basis from the standpoint of a basketball coach? Uh, yeah, for us, we, um, well, I mean, our, our trainer, I mean, basically we communicate with her every single day, um, you know, and uh, as far as our administration, um, you know, we do a weekly call. I mean, we do a call every week, but um, we also, again, emails. I mean, even our president, he does a weekly 
uh, webinar. Uh, he, he's had us on that as well, the athletic staff. So, um, you know, it's, it's the communication is constant. I mean, it's, it's just constant. So, um, but pretty much every week and I hear from, from uh, definitely my athletic director and uh, obviously my athletic trainer every day. Mike? Yeah, it's pretty similar. We're in a unique situation in that um, we have an interim athletic director right now and we had our athletic director left in the spring for um, another job. And then um, our other associate athletic director recently left. So we have one woman who's doing three people's jobs right now. And I've really tried to be respectful of her and her time. And she's trying to do this for so many sports that I'm, I'm just trying to communicate with her as little as possible. Let her get stuff to me when she's ready to. Um, our athletic trainers have been phenomenal. Um, we, at Division Three, a lot of us are going through this with our fall sports right now, and we're learning. Mm -hmm. You know, my whole thing was like, let's learn how this goes. Let's figure some things out. And thankfully, we had some people come before us to do that for us. And then once we kind of learn some lessons and things change and evolve, you know, I haven't pursued too much. A lot of information has come down to me, and I'm just kind of waiting for more. And it goes back to that flexibility concept, I think. Yeah. Doc, you touched on this earlier, but it's uh, we're, de we're dealing with a different animal, basketball and other indoor sports compared to being outdoors and football. What would you, if you had to uh, concisely explain to coaches on this call, what your definition as you know it through the CDC and then your experience, what a high risk activity would be in basketball? What, a, what, would a, what would be considered a high, to your knowledge now, based on what you've learned about the virus, what's a high risk activity for someone coaching or playing basketball? Fortunately, I, right now we think a lot of basketball would be a high risk activity. You know, football, you can stand apart and you're on a field and the wind's blowing and, you know, unless you're really engaging and tackling and yelling in someone's face, it's not high risk, really. Um, you know, basketball, if you're you're one on one, five on five and you're guarding people man to man, you're close and you're have really fit individuals and it's aerobic, you know, mainly aerobic, you're breathing a lot. So big volumes of air exchanged. So it's I think it's pretty high risk. Um, now, I, we've had some schools in our league have used some um, proximity devices that they wear. And when you're looking at minutes of interaction between players, it's not as high as you think between six feet, which is that's encouraging. And we've started to look at that. And I think we may be able to come up with um, some idea of like what drills are bad and what, what activities are, are, hard, are difficult and getting a lot of minutes close to each other. We can't really do away with the air exchange because you're going to be breathing hard. But, but really minimizing things or doing things you can control. So if you're standing on the sideline, have some X's on the floor where they know where six feet apart is. So you're not standing close when, when it's easy to be distance. We, we've, um, some of the things we thought about travel, because we think travel is really a unique situation and you're, you are in close confines. If you can think of things when you're, you know, if you want kids to wear a mask and you're getting on a bus or an airplane, don't give them food to eat when they get on the bus or the airplane. You know, have, your, have a way to have a pregame meal or a postgame meal somewhere spaced out before you're on a vehicle. You know, things we've, it kind of had to take us going through planning for a trip and even going on a trip to figure these out. But there's there's ways that you can stay spaced out, being really vigilant with masks. We, I think it takes somebody to police that, make sure it's not dropping down below their nose, that we see that, still see that all the time. And you're like, guys, you, where do you get tested for COVID? Well, it's in your nose, right? So it's probably ought to keep it covered when you're wearing a mask. Um, so a lot of things in basketball probably are going to be high risk, but that still doesn't mean that you can't play the sport. I, I think we're going to find that the actual time next to people is maybe smaller than we thought. We're going to have people tested frequently. We hopefully can pick up the positives quickly and get them out. Um, there's a lot of rules that have come out in the NCAA operations manual that just came out this week. And if you read through that, there's a lot of details in there. I think those are all good and a lot of it's spacing and how you how you set up the bench and how you do warm ups and uh -huh. I think all those things will help minimize it. Uh, well, we're disappointed in you, Doc, because given that social distancing is six feet, 
there's not going to be a lot of teams playing defense this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Kathy, you're starting to deal with these game and travel protocols. Uh, and I think just in the last couple of days, um, and there's probably coaches on this call, we have over 100 people on this Zoom call right now. What are the general basic, you don't, don't give us the details about how exactly each seat must be split apart from the others, but what are the, what is the general uh, philosophy, let's just say, of game management going to be, tra- let's start game management first, because it's, you know, we'll talk about travel next, but from what you know, and you've been a part of this. So the, ga- the game management, if you're just talking about, it, it's, it's protecting everybody on the floor. It's protecting tier one uh, against everyone else. So And what is tier one? Explain tier one. Tier one as- is, is basically everyone on the bench, for the most right. part. Um, there could be some others that would be a part of that, that travel with you. But the tier one is, is, is everybody on the bench. And um, those people, mostly it's all your players, your assistant coaches, you know, your trainers and, and, and those other folks. So, so it's really protecting tier one against everyone else. And officials are part of tier one too, just to, to let you know. So, um, so we're, everything that we put into or that we recommended in, in that place is to kind of protect that. So for instance, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't have you know normally speaking you have all these uh, halftime performances and you're going to have all these uh, you know at timeouts cheer and dance and you know whatever. At, at this point, we're not we would not recommend doing any of that because then there's no there's no chance to then go kind of clean up after that group and protect them. So basically, if you're going to have them, they'll be up in the they'll be up in the stands. Um, right. So really everything that we do and put into place and you know and the, the document has a lot of you know this detail it's really to protect that tier one and and again officials are a part of that tier one so it's our kids coaches and our uh, student um uh, officials lynn and mike i i have said recently um and i've been a 37 or eight year member of the nabc that one of the things young coaches need to really lock into going forward is the idea of mental health um how does mental health play a to your to your mind how does the mental health of you, your staff, and your and your student athletes play a part in dealing with this uh, this pandemic? You know, as it relates to you guys on a college campus. Any any thoughts there? I think it's huge, and I think it ties back to what um, the doctor was saying at the earlier about our role as coaches. Um, I do think we have a huge influence, and I think we're leaders, and I think we want to be leaders, and we're educators. And we want to be educators and we need to set a tone and we need to set the right, the right tone. And we have to have our heads in a good place to do that. Um, You know, we've been, been coaching basketball and been playing basketball for a long time. And every team that I've been a part of has talked about teamwork and unselfishness. And that's the message that I'm sending to our team is as much as any other time, we have to put other people in front of ourselves and if there's something we don't like, if there's something that we find uncomfortable or something we, you know, we don't enjoy, we have to recognize that we're doing this for the good of a greater group of people. And I think you know, I'm working to keep that positive mentality a part of my approach and you know, not focus on what I'm not enjoying about this year, but what I am enjoying about this year and the things that we've been able to do and, and the things that I'm looking forward to doing. You know. October 15th, for as long as I can remember, has been a very important day for me. It's been one of the best days of the year. And, um, you know, as we start practice and as we start getting to play, that enthusiasm is still going to be there. And the only way that's going to go away is if we allow it to go away. And I think as a coach, you know, I have to stay excited. I have to focus on that. I have to find time to find balance in my life to kind of keep my head in a place where I can be excited for the guys and be the leader I want to be. Great stuff. Lynn? Yeah, I think um, just to add to what Mike was saying, saying, I mean, I would echo all that, but, you know, we, uh, w- when we didn't get to come to summer school, we have, we had quite a few players that were very upset about that. So then you, you look now, you know, to Fran that, you know, we have players coming in that may not be in the shape they were. We have to be careful too of, of their physical health and yes, their mental health, but even, you know, they're not in the shape maybe that we needed them to be in because they weren't here. It's a lot better when you can come be part of a team. Um, but I think for us, when we were, when we first got to school, we had a player who tested positive. You know, we had the false positive and we had one that tested positive. 
And I think we have to be careful with when we do have players that do that. She did not do anything that what I would call irresponsible, but she felt awful. And I think we have to be careful that as coaches that, you know, we, we, we go, you know, that it's okay. You know, we're going to get through this, you know, it's okay. And, and especially when that player did act responsibly, you know, um, and I, and I think, you know, the thing with this thing is that again, the unknowns with some of it and, um, uh, when we went into isolate, you know, they isolated us for two weeks. So our players have to stay in the room. I think at that point, they're very vulnerable. We have to make sure we stay in touch with them. We did Zoom calls every day. Um, we we did something fun, whether it was, uh, we did like a family feud uh, with them. We did some things like that to keep their spirits up, to make sure we stayed in touch with them. We still did academic meetings. We, you know, we did, we did all that. And I think, um, you know, I have saved a lot of, you know, I've, I've filmed anyways practice, but I, one of the things that, you know, I go my six days, I have these practices and in case of members, I have a bunch of film that we can watch. I have motivational things, whether um, we did a thing on leadership. So I think it's important we keep them engaged and that um, if you do have a player or someone that does test positive, that we make sure that they don't feel even worse because these kids are going to feel bad about, about being that person. Kathy, one of the fun things about a season is travel, you know, getting on that, but you're in, a, you're in one of the greatest leagues, but everybody who plays in a league loves conference play. Uh, from a standpoint of travel right now, as you're talking with your colleagues in the Big East, some of it's planes, some of it's buses, but more specifically, um, where are we with teams traveling to other, you know, schools? How is, I don't know, it's, it's early in the game, but what are the, what are you thinking that the travel protocols are going to be to keep a team safe, both the home team and the visiting team? Well, I, I think we're, we're getting together with our conference to come up with basic, you know, basic protocols at each institution that each institution will be required to do to, to know that they're going to be treated the same way that they go to from a, either testing standpoint or meet and greet and, you know, what they're going to be allowed to do in the facility. They're not they're going to be able to use the locker room and not use the locker room. What, uh, what are we going to do with uh, post-game media, um, uh, you know, press conferences and, and things of that nature. So, we're, we're working on those things actively right now so that so they know what it's going to look like um, in terms of getting there um, and with the quarantine states. I mean, New York's up to 43, so we got seven more to go. <laughs> uh, but uh, so that's that's real unknown. Um, you know, I've heard everything from, you know, right now in New York, technically, if you can go in and out in 24 hours, you're good. Uh, and as long as you just stay in your hotel and just bring your story and you come back and, you know, what out there but we're obviously some places we're not going to be able to do that so we're going to have to work with our local uh, authorities to kind of figure that out that's still gonna that's still a very sensitive topic because frustrating because we really don't have answers for that we will have answers for what it's going to look like when you get here and how you're going to be treated and what that's going to go look like but uh, in terms of actually uh, from state to state it's still an unknown Maybe the doc can help us with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to ask doc next, when we have the vaccine ready, doc? No, I'm just joking. I'm, <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, no, but in all seriousness, um, you gave us a couple great tips earlier about masks and meals before you get on a bus or a plane. Can you give the coaches some other practical ideas? Uh, a lot of the coaches, a lot of the teams will be bus trip type teams. Others will be, you know, airplane charters, but generally, what are some go-to ideas that you might have to, to help these coaches and their travel parties stay as safe as possible as they hit the road? We, we mentioned just worrying about being in small enclosed planes and buses. If you could uh, always, when you are doing that, always have a seating chart so you know, and, and enforce it. So if you had somebody turn positive, you can go back and trace it and figure out who is near who and be accurate with it. Uh, try to minimize the time. Like if you're going to, plane's going to take off, you don't need to get and board the plane 45 minutes before and just sit there or same thing with a bus, you know, try to minimize your time in those spaces. If you need to stop and for a meal, you know, it's probably good if you can, I guess we're, we have warmer weather, so you could actually eat outside, but, um, or, or make sure you have a bigger room to eat. And, and as a host uh, institution, it would be, very nice if you could provide more or bigger locker room space. That's going to be hard, but 
some of the visiting locker rooms, as you know, are very crammed. Um, so the, the more you can space people out and even after a game have an area where they could kind of mingle and eat a meal where they're not confined in the bus um, would be would probably be good ways to eliminate the close contact part of it. What, uh, what about the idea of masks and practice? Uh, what's the what the what's the practicality when it well, let's take contact tracing first with regard to people wearing masks? Is there been any sort of proven uh, experiences so far that that's a safer way to go, that there, it mitigates some of the issues? You know, I, I think there's proof that it decreases the chance of transmission. And I think yeah, no one would argue that. But where it hasn't led to a really helpful situation is for contact tracing because your contact tracers have to be really cautious. They don't want an outbreak to occur in their community. And they're worried that people don't know how to wear masks, don't have the best mask on. So when you look at what's written, they don't really allow you to knock off uh, or, or allow you to be around somebody longer because you had a mask on. Um, and that's been really frustrating for our coaches to understand. We did everything right. We had masks. Why would they quarantine me? And I, and I really, I feel for them and I don't, uh, it bothers me too. I try to tell them, that, well, you really are doing a service to your team because the chance of someone actually getting the illness is, is lowered by wearing the mask. And that ultimately is gonna to lead to fewer infections and fewer quarantines and less missed time. But for that individual, that instant, it's hard to get a contact tracer at your health department to say, you had mask on, you don't need a quarantine, even though you were with this person for an hour, you know, close playing basketball. So it may depend a little bit on your locale and what, they're, what they feel comfortable with. But in general, we're not seeing a lot of, um, help with 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 the decrease in quarantine based on mask wearing but it still is you know really the best thing for your team to do we are seeing some of our people in our area getting a little more comfortable with it and i think they are counting that so in some of our meetings and things if you were if someone decided to meet in person and they were masked they're they're narrowing down the area of the room that they would quarantine somebody you know if you weren't in masks they may take the whole room if people were masked they may limit it down to just that four or five foot area around the person. All right, coaches, what, um, what's, your, what's your travel philosophy uh, as of right now? Uh, what are you thinking about in terms of keeping your team bubbled up you know, on the road? Uh, what have you talked about with your administrators, other coaches, and Lynn, I know it's early. Uh, hopefully you guys are still working on schedules and getting those done, but what would be as of today, the, the thoughts that you are in your head about travel and more specifically keeping your team, you know, uh, for lack of a better term in a bubble. Yeah, I think well, we, it's, we, we, um, we haven't finished our schedule. That's one of the things we've <laughs> had to do as well. And, um, you know, we've had to, because of the flying, you know, it's not so much, you know, where we're going, but we just being on a plane, we try to eliminate those games. Um, and um, because we feel like the bus is a little bit better. Uh, one of the things I've really thought about on the road is, is um, you know, ha have every player have their own room. Typically we put two in a room, but maybe have every player have their own room. And then we're, we, you know, we don't use our locker room right now unless we have to. So I'm really thinking of having our players already dressed, taped, ready to go and getting to the game you know, kind of right on time, you know, for our warm up and keeping our stuff out, at least by our bench, you know, I know we'll have to go somewhere at halftime, maybe depending. Um, so, um, but I, those are a couple of things I've thought about in regards to our team. And then as soon as the game's over, just leaving, like, don't, don't shower there, don't do anything else there, just go ahead and get on the bus. So, uh, but I think the, you know, the doctor, what he said in regard to, you know, don't stop for a meal. I mean, those are great ideas as well that I had not thought of, you know, so, um, but right off the top of my head, we, we really only have, uh, we have a, a two flights and they're in conference. Um, our conference schedule looks like they're, they're talking about it, that we might go back to back games with the same opponent, which I think will also be really good for us. Mike, you play in one of the fun leagues in all of the college basketball, all the flying you do to uh, places like Atlanta, Pittsburgh, New York, Boston. You fly everywhere, at least in conference, UAA. What, what, are, the, what are the thoughts? Well, we're not there yet is okay. the big thought. It, as I listen to this conversation of everybody here today, I, 
it, it's an analogy that I've had for a, a while in this country is that we're all on this same merry-go-round. Mm -hmm. We're just at different places on it. <laughs> and, you know, at the University of Chicago and, and at Division Three, we're still analyzing how can we practice safely? How can we go into practice every day? And, and some of the conversations so far here is about, okay, once you've got that, once you've got a positive test, how do we contact trace? How do we figure out who to quarantine? And, and we're still at stage one, which is how can we keep it from spreading? Um, because we haven't really gotten to some of that yet, at least in basketball. Um, so, you know, for us, we're, we're hopeful to have the opportunity to figure out how to travel. Um, yeah. We're hopeful to figure out the opportunity on how to met. You're right, Fran. I appreciate you pointing it out. We have a, an unbelievable opportunity in our league to, to get around the country and, and our players have an amazing experience and um, hopefully we'll have a chance to do that. And if we don't, it goes back to my point earlier. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to have a great season. We're going to enjoy our time together and we're going to make the most of whatever it is we can do. Yeah. Okay. Kathy, given that we're going to have a lot of fun and get through the season and have two great NCAA tournaments. I'm waiting for the fun, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but given that we're going to get through this uh, one way, shape or form, give me the, what's the protocol for, you know, again, getting back to scheduling and travel and games and the protocol, I know it's probably still early, but just from you can, your standpoint of, Hey, we got to cancel this game tonight. You know, like here comes the road team. Here comes Seton Hall over to Alumni Hall. Hold on a second. We're going to have to cancel this game. What, what, what's going to go into those kind of decisions, uh, you know, based on what you know right now as an administrator? Well, what we know right now, I mean, just the health and safety is going to be is going to be paramount. So as soon as we know whatever we know, um, that that would be and I, and I guess any opponent that we're going to be playing, I, I would I would assume that we're going to have ongoing conversations with whatever is happening right. um, and that there's going to be uh, there's going to already be a protocol in place for what we've already decided we were we've not only tested three times a week or maybe we're doing a little bit more and there's got to be a reporting system for where those tests are housed and how you have access to make sure that that's being taken place so if you're doing all that then and then then something happens where you have a positive we obviously are our administrators and our doctors are probably going to have to you know put together to say what position is to put us in through contact tracing or whatever depending on what we've got going on um, and then if we need to, uh, you know, pull the plug, we pull the plug because, you know, I, I would imagine some of those games would be canceled sooner than later. Um, and I mean, we're still trying to figure out a schedule. We only have a schedule right now for December. So um, we don't have a schedule yet for January, February. So, um, and we're still working on non-conference schedule. So um, yeah. that keeps changing because um, some people, it, it, it's it, every, every day is something, something <laughs> new. So I, I, don't know if we'll end up playing a full schedule. You know, uh, we're hoping to play a 20 game uh, conference schedule. And then uh, if we get all the other non-conference games in, so be it, but uh, that might end up being a little problematic. So we're, we're just in constant um, conversation and communication with uh, our, 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 our colleagues. Yeah, uh, Doc, consider, considering that we're all hoping for the best, expecting the worst, give us good news. What What's the optimum situation now we know there's going to be bumps in the road what's the optimum best case scenario as we hit let's say january 1st regarding testing a cdc guideline adjustments that relate specifically to college basketball i think it's realistic to think by january 1st we may have a, di a change in the quarantine length okay that that that, that may be the way it, what i'm hearing I just quoted you on that. I just wrote yeah. it down on the date. Okay. <laughs> I didn't say how many days. I Doctor, just said a change. Said you're good. Let's go. Okay. Um, vaccine, I have no idea. You know, your guess is as good as mine. Oh, I, know. I know that. I, I heard you say three days quarantine. I'm just joking. No. <laughs> <laughs> Coaches are optimistic by nature. Uh, but you think the, uh, the, the, the there could be an adjustment in the quarantine, in the in the, in the the length of quarantine. If there, yeah, there are a lot of people trying and it's not just being put out there just for to allow us to play basketball. I mean, it's just our whole country. There, there are countries in Europe that have 10 days or seven days even, you know, so there, there's some examples out there that appear to, to work. Yeah, good. Hey, hey Fran, also I think, yes. you know, when we put out these documents and guidances and best practices and stuff, I think I think 
forums like this and and it, it, we actually working a lot more. Our committees are working more closely together. We're going to learn a lot as, as soon as we get going. We're going to learn a lot in our first week or two out. And some of that'll be some of that'll be bad. Some of that'll be good. And 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 I believe that we're going to, you know, the collaboration that I've seen taking place over these last number of months has been awesome. And I, and I believe that that collaboration will lead to even more things. And I think as soon as we get going, we're going to learn so much more about about this. And and I think I would hope then by January first we'll be in a lot better shape for lots of reasons because we'll just know more of, of what we're dealing right. with. And hey, Mike, Ken. yeah, Mike, go ahead, please. Kathy's making a great point, and we're at the small college level. We're counting on you guys. Um, you know, the, the feedback that I'm getting the most is the cost of testing three days a week, and how prohibitive that's going to be at the small college level. And obviously, there's optimism, and you know that that can come down. And the three day testing a week is something that can become more manageable at our level, because that's the biggest thing that's going to preclude competition for even non-travel situations, just local games is schools that can't sustain that. And, you know, the more we learn from, you know, as we're trying to start in January, the more we learn from teams and programs that are going now is gonna be huge. Lynn, um, just one last thing, slightly a, 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 a off the topic a little bit, but the idea of giving student athletes, winter sports athletes, another year of competition. Now there's obviously unintended consequences that need to be worked out, but generally, philosophically, um, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's fair. I think it's a good thing to do because we don't even, you know, I think this year is going to have an asterisk by it for all of us. Like it's going to have an asterisk and because we don't know how many games we're going to get to play. We don't, you know, hopefully we get to play and you know, but a full schedule, but who knows, we might just be conference, but even at that, we don't know. So I think it's fair to, to our, to our athletes to al allow them to come back considering that uh, there's so much unknown. So uh, it's going to, um, you know, it's going to be great. You know, if you have more scholarships, of course, you know, you could carry 20 on a team that would be, um, that would be interesting for basketball. But um, I, I think Fran, it's very fair. And I think it's a good thing that they've done. Mike, scholarships are not your purview at Division Three. Yeah. What's the discussion about the extra year of eligibility? Well, it, it's it, first of all, I, I think Lynn is right. It's a terrific thing, and I'm glad the NCAA has taken that step. And it's very, very clear that they've put the athlete first in a lot of the decisions they've made recently. Um, in, during this time, you know, what's best for the athletes? You know, I, I'm not. I'm pretty sure you're no stranger to large private school tuition payments. Um, <laughs> yeah, so when you're at the non-scholarship level, um, you know, another year isn't always the only answer. It's, right. you know, and most of us are at schools that I'm not, but a lot of us are at schools where the grad programs aren't an option. And so to take advantage of that extra year of eligibility uh, I think it's great. I hope our athletes are able to have that opportunity, but I think, you know, the cost and, and how that becomes manageable is, is the next step for us. And I think it would be in the Ivy League too. You're being modest because anybody who gets an MBA from a university of Chicago is in pretty good shape. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Hey, listen, um, final thoughts. If anybody has anything to add, this has been phenomenal. Again, we've had over 100 people on this call. Uh, Doc, I'll start with you. Uh, first of all, thank all of you for incredible information. Doc, you started us off from 30,000 feet, so why don't you just land the plane? Well, I, I'll say something that I was asked by um, my incredible athletic training staff, and they said, make sure you say <laughs> to remind people to not, well, don't, don't put this all on the athletic trainer. They can't be the COVID police. So I, I said, it, and I, I think it's very true. And the more you can get the whole culture to participate and make sure everybody's on their A game to wear their mask, to save space, to not go out and do crazy things outside of sports and just to be um, cognizant of it, I think the better off you'll be. Kathy? Yeah, I, 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 I actually totally agree with them because I, I, I've worried about our training staff um, because they're getting, they're doing, they're, they're sharing a lot of the workload here with this and working with our doctors and stuff and trying to keep our kids healthy and safe. So 
you know, I would say that, you know, don't shoot the messengers sometimes. Um, so uh, really, we, we're, we're, share, we're doing this, we're in this together. You know, we, we all share the, bur we all share this, this load and let's all take it together, um, help our coaches, um, help our student athletes, help our staffs. Um, we're all, we all have, the, the, the strain has been kind of enormous for lots of groups of people. So if we all look to try and keep, keep sharing the burden, I think we'll all get through this together and we'll be in a better place, hopefully this time next year. Yeah, I, I just, well, first the WBC and the NABC, thank you for doing this and having me on. It's been, I have learned, I've taken some notes. I've learned something from each, something from each of you as well. I mean, so I think the more we share information and we are in this together, like Kathy said, the, the better. I think it's all about sharing and, you know, we're all trying to do what's best for, for our student athletes and for each other and, and providing a safe place, you know, so um, I think anytime we can share and help each other, that, that, that's a great thing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fran, for doing this and a great job. Thank yeah, you, Mike. Fun. Thank you. Go ahead, Mike. Um, I guess the one thought I have listening to everybody is we have different roles in this, but we all have the same agenda and we're all very, very, we're all very, very blessed to have the opportunity to be leaders in this. And um, the tone we set will be very, very important. And uh, I, I'm proud to have that opportunity and I hope most coaches are. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, for those who were paying attention and part of the Zoom call, we weren't able to get to every single question. Um, but if you look, if you go check with the WBCA.org and NABC.org, you'll see more and more information about how coaches are handling this unique event, uh, the pandemic. We really wanna thank and echo what Mike and Lynn said about uh, just thanking the WBCA and the NABC yeah. for their collaboration. And uh, Mike and Lynn, you both said it best. We're gonna get, get through this together mm -hmm. and uh, we'll come out on the other side of this uh, uh, crazy time. We love this game so much. Uh, we're willing to do anything we have to, to adjust it's not going to be a normal season, uh, but once Dr. Cluxton and his colleagues get that vaccine, Doc, uh, <laughs> things will be back to normal. No, in all seriousness, um, everybody, uh, thank you for your participation. It's been, it, it was thank a you. wealth of information. So thank you.